Israel's deadliest strike on Lebanon. Over 585 killed in Israeli airstrikes. When we heard the explosions, I was a bit fearful, more than usual, because it's very loud and there's no alarms. Hezbollah retaliates, but Iron Dome intercepts. Benjamin Netanyahu's big warning to Lebanese civilians. The IDF has warned you to get out of harm's way. I urge you, take this warning seriously. Don't let Hezbollah endanger your lives and the lives of your loved ones. Israel declares state of emergency. The escalating Israel-Hezbollah war is our top focus on India first. And there is massive escalation in the Israel-Hezbollah conflict in West Asia. Multiple neighborhoods are in flames and we'll show you those images of those neighborhoods in flame. More than 100,000 people. That's right. One lakh people are internally displaced inside Lebanon tonight. And in the next 24 to 48 hours, the apprehension is another 1.5 to 2 lakh people could be displaced from southern Lebanon after these massive airstrikes by the IDF or the Israeli Air Force initially. Israel says these are just preemptive strikes to deter Hezbollah from launching a Hamas-like October 8, 2023 terror attack on Israel. Remember, unlike the Hamas, the Hezbollah is much larger. It's deadlier, more organized militia with longer-range rockets and missiles and drones that can target almost any part of Israel. This clear and present danger remains our top focus on this special broadcast. I'm Gaurav Savant, as always. 1,300 targets have been taken down in under 24 hours by the Israeli Air Force in southern Lebanon. 1,300. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu went on airwaves addressing the people of Lebanon, directly telling them that people in Israel are not at war with the people in Lebanon. But this is a war against the Hezbollah. Israel then is believed to have hacked into Lebanon's communication system and radio station and people are now receiving SMS messages to leave their homes and immediately rush to safer areas because what's been targeted, look at these images that you see on your television screen. These may appear to be homes in Lebanon but Israel insists that on the ground floor and the first floor you had people living but in the basement these buildings had the Hezbollah rockets and missiles stored. Parents received SMSs telling them to pick up their children from school. Why? Because moments later, the vicinity of the school was targeted for being a Hezbollah stronghold. And 585 people, 585 people have been killed, over 1,600 injured in the Israeli airstrikes. A dangerous escalation in southern Lebanon. Israeli Air Force fighter jets bombed what Israel described as Hezbollah strongholds and weapon depots in the southern part of Lebanon. Massive plumes of smoke rose from the areas bombarded and several localities were in flames. The health ministry in Lebanon claimed more than 585 people had been killed and over 1,600 injured in the Israeli airstrikes. Up until this moment, the Ministry of Health has recorded 558 martyrs, amongst them 50 children and 94 women. Israel's defense forces made it very clear this was a preemptive strike 
to prevent a repeat of an October 7 style attack on the northern part of Israel. Israel claimed Hezbollah was planning a similar strike as part of Operation Galilee. Hezbollah uses civilian population and civilian homes as a human shield for its terrorist activities. Today we exposed this strategy. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke directly to the people of Lebanon telling them Israel was not at war with them but directing them to leave their homes immediately as Israel targeted the Hezbollah leadership, command and control structure and war fighting capabilities. I told you yesterday to evacuate the houses in which a missile was planted in your living room and a rocket in your garage. Anyone who has a missile in their living room and a rocket in their garage will not have a home. But I will tell you another thing. This is endangering your country. Rid yourself from grip of Hezbollah. Israel also released multiple videos claiming Hezbollah was forcing people to stockpile weapons, rockets, rocket launchers and other arms and ammunition either in the basement of their homes or the attic, insisting each target that posed a threat to the people of Israel would be taken down. In fact, Israeli agencies sent out messages on mobile phones in Lebanon asking people to leave their villages and homes if they had the Hezbollah living nearby. As thousands fled their homes in panic, several were caught in a fresh wave of airstrikes. There is global alarm over rising tensions in West Asia once again. We must ensure that Palestine is equipped to cope, adapt and transform in the face of diverse challenges, preparing ourselves not only to withstand future challenges, but also to build stronger, more resilient nation. The U.S. is sending additional troops to the region in a bid to ensure tensions do not spiral out of control. But by all accounts, the region remains on the edge. Bureau Report, India Today. And for the latest, let me take you straight to Beirut and get you inputs that are coming in. Joining me on India First is Professor Dunya Harajli, a professor at the Lebanese American University, and she's working with the internally displaced people. In a moment, uh, we'll also be joined, we'll go across to Tel Aviv, where we'll be joined by Sharon Haskell, a member of parliament in Israel, and Ambassador Ashok Sajjanhar is a former top diplomat who'll join us to give us a diplomatic perspective on the latest developments on ground. But Professor Dunya, um, if I may, ma'am, what's the latest situation in Lebanon as we speak? I hope all of you are safe. Gaurav, Beirut already has its own challenges. Let's not forget, the last four years have really drowned people in poverty. We've had financial, economic, political crisis in addition to the Beirut explosion, which took its toll on people. So already the people are poor, especially those in the rural areas, especially those that are coming in. So Beirut is overwhelmed already and cannot take in the influx of the displaced people. It's a big, big challenge. Although the government is trying to open up the schools, more than a hundred schools, uh, people are opening up their homes. It's not enough. There's people sleeping in the streets, no access to food or water, and the government already not in its best state. It's trying its best, but it is not enough. So the situation really, really calls for urgent international um, attention, urgent okay. international action to help the Lebanese people because this is unprecedented. Unprecedented. The number of martyrs and displaced people in the last 48 hours we have never seen in the history of this country. Well, this is said to be the worst attack um, since 2006, so in the past 18 years. But, uh, ma'am, can you give us a figure, Professor, on the number of people who are internally displaced, those who are coming from southern Lebanon? Gurav, as I speak to you right now, you can hear the sounds of ambulances. The Israelis, minutes ago, 
hit another strike in the suburbs of Beirut. People are leaving their villages, seeking safety for them and their children, and still the fear accompanies them into the city. People don't have access to shelter, to food, clean water, basic necessities, medical assistance, milk for children, blankets, mattresses, anything. How can anyone help? NGOs are trying to do their work. The government is trying to help, it's not enough. I, on a personal level, I'm part co-founder of an NGO. I'm trying my best through my yes. connections with family, with friends, to see how I can provide mattresses and basic food supplies. It's not enough. We're talking about up to a million people. No matter how much we need the world's help in any way, through NGOs, personal assistance, they want to come to Lebanon and join us with this direct humanitarian relief. All is needed right now. On ground right now, what kind of resources do you need uh, to deal with internally displaced people? Because uh, there already are reports and like you are mentioning, there's already a shortage of food and water and perhaps medicines. Gurav, you ask if people can stop Hezbollah from sending rockets to Israel. But is the resistance the problem? I mean, is the resistance the problem or is it the genocide? Is resistance the problem or is it the brutal massacring of innocent civilians, of women, of children and elderly, trying to escape and being bombarded? What is the problem? Is the problem the resistance or is it right now the the humanitarian crisis that has been inflicted as a result yes. of the atrocities. The children in hospitals that are crying for their parents and we cannot find their parents. Parents that are looking for their children under the rubble and still have not found their children. We know that in war there are bylaws. We know that Israel has crossed all of them. In Gaza for the past year and now in Lebanon. So we do call urgently for the direct help and attention in this crisis. But does the government have a strategy to deal with this dangerous escalation? Is there a mechanism to diffuse the tension? You know, the point that you were raising about Hezbollah uh, and you calling it resistance, Israel calls it terror. Is there a way to get them to stop targeting Israel and vice versa? In 2006, with 34 days of war, we had 1,100 people killed. In the last 48 hours, we have almost 600. This is the scope of the crisis right now. It seems like no one is able to stop Israeli atrocities and massacres and genocide on our people. This is something that needs the world's attention. Again, where are the bylaws of war? You stay safe, uh, Professor Dunya, for joining me here on India First. Many thanks. Uh, before we cut across to Israel and bring in uh, Sharon Haskell, a member of parliament at the Knesset uh, in Israel, I want to bring in Ambassador Ashok Sajjanhar into this conversation. Ambassador, do you see a further escalation, a further deterioration um, in the situation? Because... Hezbollah is much, much better armed uh, and trained compared to the Hamas. And if it took them a year to take down Hamas, it will take them much longer for Hezbollah. No, absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Gaurav. Uh, yes, uh, I think escalation has, you know, what we have been afraid of for quite some time. I think that has occurred. What we have seen over the last two days and, you know, as the reports seem to suggest, more than 550 people have been killed and you've seen you know, so many buildings that have been raised to the ground. And I think the the angst and uh, the hurt and the pain and the frustration that we could uh, uh, <clears throat> hear in the voice of Professor Dunya, I think that is uh, very palpable. And uh, really, this escalation has to be brought uh, to an end. And uh, the, you know, the global community has been uh, calling upon uh, Israel. But I think equally, exactly, you know, the point that you made to uh, Professor Dunya, that there needs to be equal pressure that needs to be put on Hezbollah also. Because basically, what is the 
objective that Israel is seeking to achieve as it has told yes. uh, the world and told its people. It wants its own people who have been displaced from the north of Israel to be able to go back and to live there in peace. And, and 60,000 of them, they've been displaced for the past 11 months. Yes, exactly, exactly. So I think just pointing finger at uh, one of the two protagonists is uh, not enough. Uh, it has to be, the pressure has to be equal on uh, both sides, you know, and if you look at it, uh, after October 7, when uh, Israel went after Hamas, we saw that uh, Hezbollah came on its own or at the instigation and provocation of uh, Iran, because yes. it's a proxy for Iran. So, Sir, you know, stay with pressure... me. That's a very important point you raise. Israel was focusing on Hamas. It's the Hezbollah that dived into that fight, targeting the northern part of Israel. Now, let me get you what Israel is saying, and I've spoken to a number of people in Israel. Um, last year, when the October 7 terror attacks took place, October 8 onwards, uh, I was reporting from Ground Zero across Israel. Now, Israel insists that these are preemptive strikes. These strikes are to take down the Hezbollah leadership that planned what they are calling Operation Galilee, a Hamas-style invasion of Israel around or on the first anniversary of that October 7 Hamas attack. Of course, this has officially not been confirmed by Israel, but agencies believe that that pager attack, that pager attack was to take down the tactical leadership, the middle-rung leadership and the commanding officers of um, the fighting force of the Hezbollah. What's the information that's available on the top leadership? So let's just take a look at who are the top commanders of the Hezbollah right now. Right on top is Hassan Nasrallah. He remains on top. He's alive. Ibrahim Akil, he's the operations head. And very recently, you saw Ibrahim Akil had been neutralized. Fuad Shukra, the other leader. Fuad Shukra is a main target. He's also been neutralized. But on target right now is Ali Karaki. Now, Ali Karaki is the southern brigade commander of the Hezbollah. This entire operation initially was mounted to take down Ali Karaki. Israel was under the impression he's been neutralized. Hezbollah insists he's alive. But is he? We'll perhaps have details in some time to come. But Wasim al Tawil, again, a tactical, a, a middle rung tactical commander of the Hezbollah, he's been taken down. Abu Hassan Samir, he's the training head of the Hezbollah, he's been training down. Talib Sami Abdullah, uh, he's one of the very important unit commanders. He too has been taken down. And this gives you an idea of how Israel is moving forward systematically to neutralize the leadership of Hezbollah. Ensure that Hassan Nasrallah is alone on top. But now I want to quickly cut across to Tel Aviv and bring in Sharon Haskell, a member of parliament uh, in Israel, uh, to, to tell us more about what's happening on ground. Um, Sharon Haskell, welcome. Welcome on India Today. Why this sudden escalation and these, this spike in operations against Lebanon, ma'am? Well, Rob, matter of fact, this is not suddenly. I was on your show more than six months ago, I, I think, um, uh, saying out clear that we do not want a full confrontation with Lebanon. We do not want to turn Beirut into Jabalia, and that we hope that Hezbollah would draw back to resolution 1701 that is forcing them, the Security Council has forced them to go back behind the Litani. But matter of fact is that for 11 months, they've been attacking our cities, our town, our people, massacring them, killing them, destroying their homes making it impossible to live in the area. We have tens of thousands of refugees for more than 11 months. This is almost a year that Hezbollah yes. is attacking Israel on a daily basis. So it's not suddenly. This is finally Israel decided to defend itself and push them back to defend its citizens, to defend our property, to defend our home and to defend our land. Okay. But is this, as some may argue, disproportionate use of force. Israel is now being accused of targeting civilian areas 
And so far, the information on Lebanon is that 585, at least 585 people have been killed in under 24 hours and more than 1,600 injured, madam. Well, first of all, most of them are Hezbollah terrorists. These are people whose goal, who attempted to murder Israelis, to murder children. I want to remind you, that less than two months ago, 12 children were massacred on a soccer field while playing yes. soccer. They were just kids going out to play soccer and they were massacred by Hezbollah, by their rockets, okay? So we target areas, places, and people that we know are participating, are part of Hezbollah, or places where they actually hold ammunition that kills our people. Okay, and apparently there were some inputs to indicate that there was an imminent threat to Israel. Why has a state of emergency been declared in Israel? Uh, is there an apprehension there could be a repeat of that Hamas-style attack by Hezbollah? So it, when Netanyahu declares a state of emergency, it means that us, the, the citizens, need to make sure that we're not very far away from a shelter. Every single Israeli, almost everybody, not everybody entirely, but most of us have shelters nearby. And it means that when we hear the alarm goes on, we know that there's a rocket attack from Hezbollah on our homes, on our towns. And so we have to go and find shelter. It means that in school there, it's quite tense. And in many places around Israel, uh, they actually are not uh, conducting a school day. Uh, so they, they, they stay at home. And it means that our entire day routine is broken because of this confrontation. Okay. Um, you know, as a mother of three babies, I'm quite anxious and, and, and worried for their safety. And I try to stay not very far away to make sure that they are safe and secure if the alarms actually goes on. Though, so give me a moment. Give me a moment as I try. I want to find out, is Israel laying the groundwork for an imminent ground offensive. Is that what will happen? Because the pagers or the beeper blasts, walkie-talkie blasts, the airstrikes, is it ground offensive next? Look, I, you know, every time Israel tried to defend itself in new uh, uh, and, and, and actually very productive and, 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 and in actions and actually tried to minimize, uh, you know, civilian casualties, there's always complaining about uh, 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 about how we actually do that. And so you need to understand, I understand that there's some criticism about uh, the beepers who, who, who exploded. Yes. And Israel, I have to say, hasn't taken responsibility. But if you have accurate information that terrorists, okay, thousands of terrorists are holding this okay. device and you explode them, and this way, instead of a full-scale war where there okay. could have been tens of thousands of civilian casualty. You... Fair enough. Ma'am, for joining me here on India Today, many thanks. We'll track this story. Ambassador Sajanar, I've run out of time on this part of the show, but this is a story we'll be tracking very, very closely. For joining me here on India Today, many thanks.